My name is Monica Gandhi. I'm the director of the CIFAR along with Mallory Johnson and Peter Hunt and Lauren Sterling. And we are here to welcome you to the second CIFAR seminar newly launched series. We're really, really pleased and um, very honored that you came. Um, this is actually the first talk of which we have a visiting speaker. So you will look at the schedule online and you'll see that there's a visiting speaker a dignitary, an expert, a real um, uh, you know, person who can really summarize the field for us um, each time. And then I did want to remind you that there's an extra um, CIFAR seminar on April 20th, which will be um, Dr. Tony Fauci from NAAAD. He had uh, delayed until April 20th, and we'll be sending out an announcement about that. One thing I did want to tell you is that we have decided to structure these CIFAR seminars so that an early stage investigator who's related to the speaker, who has something to do with their field, leads the morning. And so um, uh, we are going to give a fuller introduction to her later, but Amy Conroy, Dr. Amy Conroy, who is the, um, an assistant professor at CAPS, will be leading us through this morning's seminar. She'll be introducing Dr. Steve Shopta, and then she helped arrange the day. And the way that we have a day for these speakers is that we have them meet with people that they need to meet with, that they'd like to meet with, that, who want to meet with them, and then we have an early stage investigator lunch, um, usually from 12.15 to 1.30 on every Wednesday. So for those of you who are ESIs from now on, please know that you're always invited to these lunches with the speakers, and there'll always be a point person, the ESI of the day, who's Amy Conroy, who will help um, arrange your day. So I will uh, turn it over to Amy to introduce Dr. Shokta. Thank you. Thanks so much, Monica. So I'm very pleased to announce our guest speaker today, Dr. Stephen Shapta, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and professor of family medicine at UCLA. He also directs two centers. One is the Center for HIV Identification Prevention and Treatment Services, known as CHIPS, and the Center for Behavioral and Addiction Medicine. His research is focused at the intersection of addiction and HIV transmission, particularly in the Western US, where stimul stimulant use is one of the strongest predictors of HIV. Dr. Shapta has spent many years working on methamphetamine treatments that utilize both behavioral and pharmaceutical approaches, and he has a very strong interest in contingency management approaches. In addition to his long history of US-based research, he also works in several international settings, including Vietnam and South Africa, where he's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Cape Town. His research in Cape Town centers on issues involving methamphetamine, um, treatment approaches, neuroscience and epigenetics, and as well on cigarette smoking and HIV. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Shapta, who will be presenting on methamphetamine and HIV, the next decade of HIV prevention. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Monica. Uh, thanks for recognizing so uh, upfront that addiction is a major piece in the work in HIV prevention. I, I very humbly will put forward the idea that methamphetamine is um, going to be the next decade of uh, our work in HIV prevention, and I'm going to lay out the reasons why I think that today. So um, why does it matter that we focus on substance use in HIV? Well, for 80% of the people who are living with HIV or at risk, they do just fine with standard treatments. They can take their medications, they can take PrEP, they can do all the things they need to do to keep their serostatus uh, negative or to keep their viral loads suppressed. It's about 15 to 20 percent of the people who are out there at any one time. This isn't like these, like they, they're branded on the head with I'm the 15 to 20 percent. It's these actually move, these people move in and out of this space um, and during that period we need tough decisions. So why do I focus on methamphetamine? Well one of the reasons is because why we have, what we have going right now in U.S. is an erosion of health resources. It's not just the erosion of health resources, but it's erosion of the availability of health resources. So you can see things like Seattle, where you have people living close to harm reduction but can't get there. So HIV outbreaks happen. You have the issue of substance use and mental health disorders. The people in this 15 to 20 percent are more likely to have these substance, these disorganizing behavioral conditions that interfere with them being able to meet their health goals. And then you have this horrible 
rich society and this increasing level of just abject poverty that is just killing us. Um, and when you put these three things together, you have these HIV outbreaks that are happening here in US um, and in particular among people who are living with these conditions. So I really do believe that this is our next condition, next direction. So I'll stop preaching, but kind of get to the idea here that this is a cranky man with HIV. This is Ferd Egan who actually gave me my first shot at doing work with people with methamphetamine and HIV because he trusted me that I would listen and after 25 years, I've listened a lot, and I think I've learned a lot. So I'm not going to do a brain dump, but I'm going to hit the major points today. Um, the overview today is epidemiology, some biological links about methamphetamine, the direct effects of methamphetamine with um, HIV, and behavioral links, policy considerations. This is my my uh, work spouse, Kathy Reback, her uh, original ethnography. If you haven't read this, the slide deck is here, so you should absolutely read this. It's 20 years old, 25 years old. It still tells the story of men who get involved with uh, methamphetamine in a very rich and non-judgmental way, and you'll walk away as a clinician or as a researcher understanding these ideas in a lot deeper way. Because we'll f the focus is on the reasons why men who have sex with men engage meth, and it's not just all getting high, it's about the issue of identity, being a gay man, being a drug user, HIV status. It enhances sexual functioning. It allows some men to have sex in ways that they can't without the drug. It boosts self-confidence. It increases productivity. It, it causes weight loss, strong body experiences. It brightens mood, and it helps with aging or living with AIDS. So it's really hard to find the downside to this drug. And in fact, if you've worked with people who are using methamphetamine, that's one of their primary arguments, is that this drug fits so well with my life, it's really hard to walk away from it. So as you know, I live, if, if, if methamphetamine addiction is K2, I live at the base camp um, of, of addiction. So for, let me show you what's outside my door. Um, the, the idea here is that uh, substance use uh, has been reconceptualized as a spectrum disorder. So substance use disorder has been shifted with DSM-5 from abuse and dependence into a single characteristic, a, a single diagnostic category that ranges from mild to moderate to severe. And you can see here um, that on the left side of the slide, people who either uh, don't use or use at levels that don't cause problems, well, those guys are having fun. If you continue going across, you see, you see fewer people who are involved, and you see that the intensity of the problems increase, um, and you start to have fun with problems. For people who continue to use, uh, you see that there's even fewer people, but the problems get more entrenched, and you start moving to the levels of mild to moderate substance use disorder and addiction at the, at the right, and then the use of the drug is no longer fun. It's just about problems. So this is a very nice schematic to remember when you're working with people to think about where they fit and think about ourselves in terms of alcohol or whatever. But the, the idea of you know, the, where we fit in the spectrum is an important place because it has a lot to do with intervention. This is the DSM-5 uh, categories, uh, uh, the b behavioral categories for addiction. Um, I just, you can look at these later. One of the take-home points from this slide is there is no biomarker here for addiction. All of addiction is defined by a behavioral category. So a, a, a urine screen that tests positive is not a symptom of addiction. It's a symptom of, of a person using drugs. It says that they've just recently used drugs. It doesn't tell you whether that person has addiction or not. It just says that they've recently used the drug. So <clears throat> right now we don't have a biomarker of addiction. And I think in the next 10 years, I'm hoping that we see something in the, that develops in this way. Because uh, it will help us in terms of thinking about articulating the population and also being more specific in terms of our treatments. In terms of epidemiology, what we see is that methamphetamine is coming to the East Coast. My friend Aviva Lee Peretz, who's the chief of OB at Boston University Medical Center, she <coughs> has noted that the primary reason that pregnant women are coming in and testing positive for drug in Boston is methamphetamine. So there are problems with methamphetamine are moving east. Um, so just as fentanyl is moving west, um, these, these are data from Ted Cicero showing the, the increase in methamphetamine positive uh, results for people who are coming in for opioid treatments in the U.S. And you can see this very strong increase. 
Um, if we look at death rate um, in the U.S. in terms of the opioid overdose, what we can see is that <clears throat> to, the, uh, to the east of the country, we see uh, methamphetamine not very involved with m methamphetamine very entrenched in the west. My colleague, <clears throat> Bob Twillman, actually pulled data from a um, urine test clinic company, um, and this was just published in JAMA Open Network, showing that from primary care visits, just testing the drugs that showed up as positive um, across the country, these are millions of patients. You can see over the years, here's methamphetamine. Um, a positivity rate going through the roof starting in about 2016 but continue to increase. Fentanyl is also on a parallel slope up with heroin sort of stabilized um, and cocaine about where it is. This is the fentanyl positive um, group with the comorbid other drugs. You can see fentanyl here. Here is heroin, the blue line, and methamphetamine on that, on that really sharp uptick. Now this is not these are not patients who have methamphetamine use disorder. These are not patients with fentanyl use disorder. These are patients seen in primary care settings who are testing during their annual wellness event exams. And then the death rates we can see, and uh, we've, we've made the point, but this is uh, recent data from um, Hedegaard at the C CDC showing that in the West, we, we worry about people dying from methamphetamine, whereas fentanyl is still in ascending in the east, which kind of, given the silence from, the, from, the, from our political capitals, my colleagues, my mentors published this paper a long time ago. It was an editorial. You don't even need to read the editorial. If a U.S. drug abuse epidemic fails to include a major east coast city, can it be called an epidemic? Um, and those of us who've been working in the west our entire career, we know you don't call it an epidemic. Um, street outreach data from Kathy Reback. You can see methamphetamine over time. This is first half of 2000 all the way to 2007. You can see methamphetamine rose and reached its height somewhere around the mid 2000s on the street in Los Angeles, whereas the primary drugs that are being used was alcohol. For whatever reason, marijuana was falling. As she's continued this, we've seen marijuana go back up and methamphetamine to entrench around 40% of patients, of uh, people on the streets. Los Angeles County, these indicators are crazy. I'm going to stop hammering about the idea here, but you can see a 475% increase in meth deaths over the past 15 years. Um, you can see that uh, these are hospitalizations. You can see just a lot of 305% of uh, uh, these deaths. Uh, it's just it, all, the, all the indicators are indicating that we got a serious problem. And why are we focusing on HIV in relevance to this? Well, because in two different very large cohort studies, Beryl Koblen's Explore study, um, uh, which was part of HPTN, showed that the fr attributable fraction of HIV incidence in MSM related to methamphetamine use was 16%. And uh, David Ostro and Michael Planky showed it's 33% in the max. So these numbers, I mean, there's a wide variability between 16 and 33%, but we're talking about at least, you know, somewhere between 15 to 20, 25, 30% of new HIV cases among MSM being attributable to HIV. So that captures my attention and sort of solidifies my work in terms of working at this intersection. So we built this cohort study to begin ask some questions about the direct interaction between drugs of abuse and HIV transmission. Dr. Pamina Gorbach is my MPI with this, my co-PI, um, and we've been running this study now for about seven years. It's, um, we call it the M study, uh, a shameless plug uh, at themstudy.org is the uh, place where you can sign on and uh, get a concept sheet and just like the Max, begin thinking about some of these um, questions. We have have over 70,000 bio samples in the bank. These include things from serum, blood, plasma, um, saliva, nails, hair, uh, PBMCs, rectal swabs, sponges. Um, we have all kinds of compartments of samples collected, <laughs> and lots of them. So um, now, why is this important? Because the cohort is built prospectively on two factors. One is drug use. Half of the sample are active drug users, providing a urine sample that's positive for a drug at baseline. And then 
half of the sample is a non-drug user. Then the other factor is HIV. Half of the sample is HIV positive and half are, are, are chosen to be HIV negative. So we have the capacity to begin asking very specific questions about people in different compartments. And let me just give you this overview. Um, we, we're currently running, these data are a little old, I thought this was a later slide, but at any rate, um, our HIV incidence now is about 3.5 percent. We continue to have, um, we have, um, we've had 11 seroconverters um, and eight deaths. Uh, the seroconverters, 10 of the 11 were under the influence of methamphetamine and one was alcohol, a blotto binge drinking episode where the guy woke up in a hotel room and doesn't remember three days prior and turned HIV positive as a result of it. Um, one of the take homes from this study I wanted to, to point out though is that right off the bat we've seen a difference in the preference for drugs being used with, um, let's see, this are, the gray bars are negative and the positives are orange and you can see here that marijuana, the gray bars, HIV negative guys are more likely to use um, marijuana than HIV positive participants, whereas it reverses with methamphetamine and look at this, it's almost two to one. Methamphetamine among HIV positive versus HIV negative. So we've kind of thought about that. One of the things that we see from that is that prospectively the men are getting the message that if you're using methamphetamine and you're HIV negative, it's a time to event sort of thing. You're going to turn HIV positive. So those who can quit and cut down their methamphetamine use do as a prevention strategy. Um, and it's an interesting idea, but um, this, this difference has maintained since we started the cohort. So it's, it's out there in the community, which we're very grateful for, that this idea about this drug being particularly pathognomonic, um, and uh, we're very happy that that goes on. In terms of, so, so let's look at some of the biological links. Now, why am I paying attention? I'm a psychologist. Why would I pay attention to biological links? Because I can remember being in rooms where my patients would tell me things like, uh, hey, you know, I'm taking my antiretrovirals, but for whatever reason, I'm, I'm biremic. I can't get it under control. And so then you start asking, well, are you using methamphetamine? Yeah, but not that much. And it's like, I hadn't used methamphetamine prior to the blood draw and all this. Sort of, I don't quite get it. So I actually believe people when they talk to me sometimes. And <laughs> so it started an idea that maybe there is something going on with methamphetamine um, and pro-inflammatory cytokine release or antiretroviral therapy efficacy. So what we did um, is we've organized all our work around this initial observation. These are medical care coordination outcomes from Los Angeles. These are data currently under review. This was presented last year at CROI. So the medical care coordination program in Los Angeles County is much like what you have here, where you have someone who is either viremic, HIV positive, um, or someone who has chaotic behavioral factors, and the clinician says you could really use some extra support. The medical care coordination team in involves a nurse case manager, a social worker, and a navigator. So people come into this program not willingly. They come in, I mean, they're nominated to come into the program. I mean, they, they, it's not Russia. They, they could elect not to be in it. But they, they, uh, they could, um, but, but the, you get the invitation. It's not something you come in and say, I want this extra resource. So, so I have a postdoc, Michael Lee, who actually modeled the probability of viral suppression um, prior to coming into the treatment. This, this is the year, let's see, can you see it? This is the year prior to coming into the MCC um, program. And then this is the, there's this jump that happens around the time that you begin MCC enrollment. And, and, and you can see that the probability of viral suppression goes up and r remains up for most groups. The two groups where it doesn't work as well are the groups with comorbidities. This is this purple line. And as you break out the comorbidities, you can see that the two that lay on top of each other are methamphetamine use and homelessness. Okay, so some of I'm seeing nods of the head and it's like, yeah, I know those patients. We, uh, we know those, we know who they are. So, so it's, so the issue here is not just, a, the take home from this is, I mean, it's a, there's a lot to talk about this slide. It's very fun to look at. This is a program evaluation. It's not a clinical trial. So these are tens of thousands of observations over these periods. Um, but what we can see here is this profound effect of stimulants in terms of reducing the likelihood of viral suppression. So does that mean all those people are out there not taking their medication? Well, some early data, these are data from Ellis, 
um, in 2003. This kind of goes back to that same sort of thing of how do I understand my patients. So I'm going to cut to the story. What they did is they took, they took urine to test for methamphetamine. They took self-report to ask whether you used methamphetamine. And then they took a blood sample on the day you came in to your uh, uh, HIV care uh, treatment setting. And so they kind of like did a sort of like panel of what happened as a result of those three factors. So what the bottom line was, was that in here, the, the, the light bars here, these are viral levels for people who are not on ART, right? The, bra the brown ones here are people who are on ART, and then the bottom part here is whether you are tested negative for meth, and you tested, uh, and you said you didn't uh, use meth. So that group here, you're clearly lower than the comparators who are coming in and not on ART, uh, ART. If you come in and you test positive for meth, um, and you, I'm sorry, if you say you used meth, but you test negative for meth, so the urine is, is negative, but you said you used, so you're positive there, you, you, you look the same. So that was kind of funny. But if you test positive for meth, independent of what you say, you have high viral loads. So what was that? Well, uh, originally, Ellis said the simplest explanation is the people aren't taking their medication. Um, but that, goes in, that flies in contrast with my patients who are saying I'm taking my medication. So what could be going on? Well, on the right side of the chart, I'm not going to go into this, but there are clear ways in which drugs of abuse interact with the immune system in important ways that could change um, how HIV is expressed. Jen Fulcher, a new uh, infectious disease doc in our group, actually took this observation and helped us bring a study up, up to, to fruition. What we did is we took methamphetamine using HIV positive and HIV negative men, and we brought them into the um, anoscopy suite uh, on the basis of their urine tests. So they, they would come in and they would tell, this, this was the study from hell. It took two years to populate the study. We got methamphetamine users out of bed who came in and tested. If their urine was positive at 8 a.m., we got them into the anoscopy suite at 9 so that we could actually get rectal tissue, rectal sponges, all kinds of things. So we, we didn't know when they had last used methamphetamine, but we knew it was within the last 48 hours or so. So we had a real proximal marker. So when we began to look at what was going on in terms of pro-inflammatory cytokine release, we knew we were able to document that there was methamphetamine recently on board. And we compared that group with HIV positive and HIV negative to people who hadn't used methamphetamine. They came in and their urine did not show any evidence of methamphetamine, both groups. Jen was able to show that in gut, recent exposure to methamphetamine substantially increases pro-inflammatory cytokine release compared to not using methamphetamine. So that was pretty cool. I mean, that was, that was pretty cool. The, the kicker of this is that circulating blood did not show the same sort of pro-inflammatory cytokine release. So it was specific to the compartment of gut. Now, why is that important? Well, because HIV transmission happens in gut. Right? So if you have somebody who is on ART, who's recently taken methamphetamine, you've actually pushed pro-inflammatory cytokine release. You may or may not have, the, you, you may have actually partially released the lever of ART on immune function, in essence letting more viremia out and a potential for transmission. Works more clearly the other way in terms of explaining some of this infection rate, whereas if you have an HIV negative person who is taking methamphetamine in gut, you have pro-inflammatories, cytokine circulating, you have the immune system activated and it comes into contact with HIV, you've actually stimulated the process that will engage infection. So it's an interesting sort of biological explanation of what we're seeing in terms of um, um, HIV. Uh, Jen also published these data um, showing that there are differential effects of drugs of abuse on microbiome, showing that methamphetamine is significantly linked with really angry bugs in the gut, um, and that marijuana is significantly linked with kinder, gentler bugs. So, I mean, in terms of behavior or transmission, it doesn't really, we don't know what that means, but um, it, it does show that there are these individual effects that go on. 
Well, you see broad behavioral effects as well. Marjan Javenbach, <coughs> this is now um, accepted for publication of drug and alcohol dependence, showing that in both HIV positive and negative uh, men, uh, methamphetamine increases depressive, depressive symptoms. And I know that some of the folks here in San Francisco have been working along this line for a long time, Adam Carrico in particular. And uh, of course, Milo, you've been working on some of these things in terms of looking at mood as, as things uh, go through people's lives in HIV and seeing this, this is very common. Um, one of this, these are data that I'm actually, um, I have to respond to the journal, but um, these are under review as well. And this is another question that I have, which is, is there an advantage in health in terms of not being a pig in terms of using methamphetamine? So is there an ability to see significant reductions in damage to health if you actually use less methamphetamine than somebody who's using more? And the answer seems to be, well, it depends. So if, if we look here, um, you know, I'm just going to like get us to the to the take home here. You can see that the arrows here, this is weekly or more use reported of methamphetamine in the past six months. This is monthly or less uh, methamphetamine use in the past six months. And these are visits, not people. And these are no methamphetamine mentions. And what you can see here is that for most of the negative uh, st structural determinants of health, social determinants of health, you can see significant stepwise reductions in, that correspond with level of dose for unemployment, unstable housing, being in jail, being a smoker, uh, using heroin, doing poppers, having concurrent partners, and being syphilis positive. Where it breaks down are things like HIV positive. Any, meth any methamphetamine mention, mention puts you about two-thirds more likely to be HIV positive than some, a man who doesn't report using methamphetamine. Cocaine use is pretty similar. Binge drinking, um, uh, people who are using a lot don't binge drink so much. And of course, we know that people here who are using methamphetamine are going to be older because they're more likely to be HIV positive and because in our sample it t that, that, that age corresponds with that, that's what that is. So, so th these are under review and it actually has some implications for things in terms of thinking about outcome variables. That abstinence from methamphetamine may not be the best thing to think about for our patients. That actually there could be significant health enhancement by reducing the amount of methamphetamine that people are involved with. I, I think that's one of the big take homes of the past few years that I've, I've um, uh, kind of come to get my head around that this, this, uh, there is a health benefit in reduction. Um, one of the places here, I'm, and, and this is again, I, I work with a lot of students. This is a, a medical student who published this paper last year in drug and alcohol dependence. So Kathy Reback and I have a study where we did contingency management for methamphetamine use disorder. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a little bit. But this guy came along and said, what happened 20 years later? So he went into the public health indexes and pulled up all the death indexes of people who died in our, from following our study. And these are the survivor curves. You can see here, these, this is HIV positive, no uh, smoking, OK? Really cool. This is no HIV infection or uh, smoking. You can see that both of those are about the same in terms of survival. And then, then you bring in HIV positive. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you, the, the, this is tobacco use but no HIV infection. So these are smokers but not HIV infected here. And then look what happens here. These are HIV positive and smokers. So you see this huge drop in, more, in, in survivability that happens over the past, say, you know, the, you know this, this period. It starts here at about, you know, year six, the, the five, the, the curves start to separate and you can see that the significant effect of the combination of methamphetamine and HIV in this group. And in fact, if you look at the 20 year crude mortality rate, it's almost five times more likely to die if you have gay men who have meth exposure who are HIV positive who also increase in, in incorporate tobacco use in their life. So so one of the take another take home from today is if you're working with your patient, they're HIV positive and they're using methamphetamine and they're smoking, there's substantial health benefit to get them to quit. So this is the summary of all the, the significant stuff in the, in the biological. Uh, it, it works with pro-inflammatory cytokine response in HIV positive. The gut floor is disturbed by methamphetamine in opposite fashion to marijuana. Um, there's a dose response effect that goes on. And smoking is bad for everyone, but especially for meth-using people living with HIV. 
So what about behavior? What are we going to do? I mean, I was talking to Dan, and he was saying, like, we got, we got this issue of what are we going to do about behavior. I'm going to breeze us through this. Their behavior change tools, contingency management, or what my participants originally called with Kathy Reback, they, they called it peeing for dollars. This, this, uh, this is a, a really important way of helping people to stop. These are our original data showing contingency man management, just providing urine that's clear of methamphetamine metabolite significantly, that's this, that's this, this bar here during treatment outperformed cognitive behavioral therapy, outperformed talk therapy. If you combine the two, you get a bit of a boost. It's not significant. Um, and it's, if you, I mean, this is, this is amazing to me about thinking about, we weren't talking about how to arrange your life, get, get right with your parents, nothing like that. It was like just providing this, the, 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 um, the, the vouchers. Uh, another student, Kimberly Ling, came along and took my data and said, what happens if we look at the behavioral economics? Is there an underlying mechanism of contingency management? So she looked at our data post hook and was able to show that we had a post hook sorting out of people who saved their vouchers versus people who spent their vouchers. And you can see here, if you just look at them, this is, this is how they sorted out, 11.7 to 2. So it's like, it's seriously, boom, just like that no manipulation of the data. And what she saw was that I have yet to see an efficacy data slide that looks like this, where spenders were significantly more likely to have proportions of negative urine results at any point during the trial compared to savers. So what does that mean? A very good question. Um, I think there's a whole other talk that I do that has to do with sort of the neural cognitive uh, aspects of things. Methamphetamine users are significantly more likely to make decisions of risk in the setting of recent loss. Okay, that's something to meditate on as you walk out of here today. Um, it's, it's programmed. That's, that's how methamphetamine hijacks the brain can significantly more likely to make decisions of risk in the setting of recent loss. So as you're thinking about brain as you walk out of here today, that's something to really kind of meditate about. 6.26% decrease of likelihood of being positive for methamphetamine at the next clinic visit. Um, contingency management, Rafi Landovitz, now a full faculty member with us, has been able to show that contingency management helps promote completion of PEP and adherence to PEP medications just by targeting methamphetamine use. Certainly we're thinking about that in terms of trials coming up and targeting methamphetamine versus um, ART adherence. And Monica, you have that great urine sample, which makes this opportunity to be really something that we could do right now. Um, and it could be very important. Um, our buddy, Phil Coffin, did this thing that's hardest to do in science, which is the same thing twice. <laughs> And he was able to show in a randomized placebo-controlled trial that you see about a 15 to 18 percent reduction of methamphetamine use. These are percent positives, right, across the trial. Um, this is the original trial done by Grant Colfax and folks here. Milo, you've been a major part of this. This is the this is the M2 team. Okay, excellent. You guys rock. Um, um, so, and you can see here. I just this is mine. I, this, I just wanted to see what the 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 slope would look like on the regression line. This is not a regression line. That's just me drawing in <laughs> in on um, PowerPoint because I don't know how to use computers. But um, <laughs> but you can see that this this the slope is really amazingly significantly similar. The number needed to treat that I calculated at 12 weeks is 8. So that's a really nice um, number to know. It puts it in the area of uh, Vivitrol for alcohol use disorder. So, you know, in terms of if you want to look at the effect size that you can expect using mir mirtazapine, um, that's about what it is. Uh, Adam Carrico was able to in integrate an 8 sessions uh, of uh, mindfulness and kind thinking with contingency management in HIV positive meth users and show significant, somewhat significant changes in, in positive affect. I'm not quite, I mean, these are important, but I'm not sure what goes on, but sort of, um, it's probably there. Tom Patterson and Stephanie Strathy was able to show that if you provided um, uh, these sorts of uh, discussions about unsafe sex, condom use, negotiating safer sex, social support, and disclosure 
of HIV status in active drug users who are HIV positive or negative, you can see that um, percent positive of protected sex in the um, experimental group outperforms a control condition. Uh, Kathy Reback again has been doing some amazing work with theory-based text messages for stimulant use. If you do nothing else, download the slide deck and look at this. It's, it's got some really cool stuff. She has now a, a, a library of almost 600 slides, uh, 600 messages that are targeted to different uh, health belief, uh, social be health change models, social support model, health belief model, social cognitive model. It's awesome. And when she's looked at this in terms of efficacy see what she's able to show. I'm not going to unpack this slide because I don't have a lot of time left, but what she does show is that um, in contrast to what you might think, just providing um, those canned text messages significant, significantly outperforms uh, people on the end of the line who are live people corresponding with the participant for methamphetamine use in the past 30 days and sex on meth in the past 30 days. So all you got to do is send out the text, the canned text messages. It actually works better than having somebody on the other end of the line. Now I've looked through some of the messages because she records all this sort of stuff and you know you, it's just these canned messages and these people are responding to these canned text messages even though they know it's likely that they're canned or there's a potential for it to be canned. They're, they're talking to the, the, the computer as if it's a person. So there's like these conversations going on and that is another study on itself just to report a paper on that just to talk about how people think about what the messages are that come across your cell phone. You know, it's, it's, if it's on your cell phone, you automatically imbue it with something extra. I don't know what it is, but that's a whole other thing. So the strategies for behavioral response, contingency management works and it works in a lot of different ways and if it were a medication it would be the standard of care for the treatment of methamphetamine use disorder. So it pisses me off that I have to say this in rooms like this, but I'm going to say it in rooms like this until it becomes the standard of care. Um, this is really an important and flexible and powerful approach for helping people to meet their uh, goals regarding amphetamines. Uh, uh, we want to reduce methamphetamine use. It reduces HIV transmission behaviors and it improves HIV prevention medication adherence. Cross-cultural efficacy. We need to think about behavioral economic factors that operating here. Affect regulation may boost outcomes. Um, uh, meth users can benefit from brief MI. Um, medications. For the first time since I've been giving this talk, I can say we now have a medication that we have two trials that argues for people to use in patients in clinical settings. Mirtazapine, 30 milligrams, once a day, actually has two trials showing efficacy in reducing 15 to 18 percent of methamphetamine use in people. So we can argue about whether people will take uh, mirtazapine or they'll worry about getting fat or whatever. I don't know how it works. That's another study, but it works. So we now have a medication. Um, and then finally, you know, the issue about cigarette smoking synergizes negative health behaviors. Okay, that's all fine and good. But what happens if we do nothing else? Like right now, we're at this position of end the HIV epidemic. So these are data from Bowdoin Nosek. It just got published um, showing that in Los Angeles, what happens if we do nothing else in terms of the number of new diagnoses in the next 25 years per 100,000 population? And you can see here that if we just kind of keep doing what we're doing, spending, you know, $15 million on HIV prevention a year uh, across a county level, we have zero impact on the incidence marker. Zero. Okay, so why am I saying that? Because we have this big pot of money from a president who is saying that he wants to change this, this direction. This is something that we have to get specific about. And it goes back to that first slide. We have to start thinking in disaggregated terms. We have to think about leaving people alone who are doing well and doubling down on the people who are not. So here's my next 15 years. I say it's 15, it may be 10. I'm not going to be here 15 years. But you know, what we need to do is we need to focus on disaggregating our work, to focus on the biological effects, the behavioral inhibition, disinhibition, the cognitive effects of methamphetamine, particularly on HIV incidence and MSM as one of the places we need to focus. 
We need to recognize intersectionalities of meth users. Focus on race, ethnicity. Pay attention to comorbidities. And then always, always, always start paying more attention to the structural determinants. And there's no point in giving a person a medication if they have no place to put it because uh, they're homeless. Uh, getting smart with investments and monitoring outcomes. We need data systems that talk to each other. This is one of the things that's really high on my list right now, is just pushing our systems so that we can share data to better and more quickly get, uh, get signals back about what's happening. Ambassador Burks did that in Africa. Why can't we do that here? Um, and then finally, um, we need to think about simultaneous involvement of existing levels of public health, addiction, and primary care systems, not in silos but together in rooms like this where we actually sit down and come up with a coherent, integrated strategy. Okay, stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapta. Monica, you want um, So we have about five minutes for questions. That was really great. I was really horrified by the methamphetamine overdose on the left side in red and how much, because I think that people under-recognize how um, a non-opiate overdose can happen. And if you could just make mention of that and how much is that in the public health um, view that, we, that people die from methamphetamine just like they die from opiate. Great question, Monica. Um, it's, it's pretty much absent. So like if I were to poll the room, do you know how a methamphetamine person dies from overdose? I don't know that people would know the symptoms, right? It's, it's hyperthermia. It's, it's uh, rhabdo. It's, it's about shut, organ shutting down because body, core body temperature goes up and you can't stay hydrated. So you die that way. It's, it's very different than dying, say, from opioids where you just gently go to sleep. So it's, it's, a, it's a very awful, you know, people are bouncing around the emergency rooms. You have to hit them with Haldol or you, you got you to gotta bring them down. And then as you bring them down, then you have to worry about hyperthermia. So there's lot, so there, we need to increase our education at lots of different levels. But we also like, you've got Julie Dembroski up here at the, at the, uh, Dembroski at the NPR. She's awesome. I've gotten more action off of a little bitty, I mean, Dan, you were on this. I mean, it was, she really rang the bell in terms of bringing methamphetamine to the fore uh, about a few months ago. Um, but what we need is we need some way that we can keep this message in the, in the front burner. Our MEs know about this. The medical examiners are all very aware of this, but the information stops there. It doesn't get back into the interventionist. It doesn't come back to the university, uh, at least in LA. Maybe it does here, but it doesn't in LA. So you know, we, we, we've, we've got ways in which we're just not talking to each other to bring this up. Yeah. Any other questions? So Steve, your, the model you present at the end can almost be seen as the model we presented at the end can almost be seen as optimistic yes. that things stay flat, right? Yes. So we have so many indicators in the drug use world that are increasing. We have a national model just came out um, that says that HIV clustering in among populations who use drugs um, increases. We don't get a generalized HIV outbreak, but we do get more of what we're seeing, which is that we've already had six or seven uh, people who inject drug clusters of HIV around the country. So. What are your thoughts of that about, you know, meth use is going up, uh, fentanyl is a frequent, uh, frequent cycling drug, you know, a frequent use drug, about, uh, you know, are you really optimistic that things stay flat or, or is HIV going up? Well, <laughs> as a cynic, I'm pretty dis depressed by all this because I do think that we are fiddling while the, the ship is sinking. Um, we are not paying attention to these indicators. So Monica, your point about we can document with exquisite precision how many people are dying, but nobody's doing anything about it. You know, I think one of the things that I think it's health, I mean, about the addiction piece, the other part about this is true, and I'm, as somebody who's got 10 years of working with the HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, and now working with ACTG, is that addiction has yet to be incorporated formally as a chronic illness within the setting of primary care. 
and that's got to change. It's not. I mean, this this is we are. We're not even at 1985 where psychiatry was with the development of SSRIs in terms of managing depression. But that's where we are. We're way behind the curve on that, but we've got to follow that path. Primary care needs to get involved. And we don't need to talk about this, but like, have you ever tried to get a patient into medication for you know, opioid use disorder in an outpatient setting? No, you can't do it. You've got to go through the emergency department one of the most expensive healthcare interventions that we have is about the only one that will treat the patient same day. So it's, it's, we, we've got some work to do here in terms of like educating our field, building alliances, getting people comfortable about treating addiction within primary care settings. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we are going to, nobody leave, we're having a slight transition here. So as Monica mentioned at the outset, we are pairing early stage investigator talks, very brief talks. So uh, it is my pleasure to now introduce Amy, who, who has already been uh, talking with you. So um, in a little bit more detail than we gave at the outset, Dr. Amy Conroy is an assistant professor uh, here at UCSF. She's in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Prevention Science, where CAPS is, the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. She received her PhD in Health and Behavioral Sciences and her Master's of Public Health from the Univers University of Colorado, Denver. Her research spans the fields of social psychology, anthropology, sociology, and public health, and broadly focuses on uh, social and behavioral responses to HIV services, particularly HIV testing and antiretroviral therapy in Sub-Saharan Africa. She'll be sharing her work on uh, developing an economic and relationship strengthening intervention for HIV affected couples who drink alcohol in Malawi. And again, this is going to be a, a brief teaser, a taste of her research. So we're, she's going to have eight minutes only and then a couple minutes for questions. So this is uh, a, a tight ship we're going to be running here. So thank you, Amy. and. Um, welcome. Thanks so much, Mallory. So um, the impetus for this study, this is an R34 that was just funded in August, um, comes from a KO1 award, which is the Emozi and Banja project. And I just want to talk a little bit about that before moving into the pilot study. So this was a mixed methods observational study with adult married couples with at least one partner living with HIV in Malawi. And the overarching goal was to understand how relationship dynamics, so things like intimacy, trust, communication, support, impact HIV treatment engagement and to develop a plan for a couple-based intervention. However, early on in the qualitative phase, we really started seeing alcohol use emerging as a predominant theme that we hadn't thought about initially. And so I sought out a CIFAR um, pilot award to do more in-depth investigation with a sub-study of alcohol users. And we wanted to explore how alcohol impacts families and relationships, how partners are involved in reducing alcohol use, and some of the barriers and facilitators to reducing alcohol use. So in the, the KO1 study, this is some of the quantitative data. I don't have time to go into too much detail, but I just want to highlight the strong linkages in this sample of 211 couples between alcohol use, intimate partner violence, and adherence to ART. We recently published a qualitative paper coming from um, the Emozi and Banja project, really speaking to the idea of couple interdependence and how partners impact each other and the alcohol in turn impacts the relationship. And so we found qualitatively that um, male drinkers struggled with adherence, which is no surprise. However, a more striking finding was that their HIV positive wives who did not drink alcohol were similarly impacted in terms of their adherence through the male partner's drinking. And we believe some of the mechanisms relate to food insecurity, intimate partner violence, and just having a partner who's intoxicated and can't support them with their adherence. So in our CIFAR study, we really sought out to look at the multi-level needs of alcohol using couples. And so this is the socio-ecological framework that you're all familiar with. And I'll just highlight a few themes. Um, the first theme is at the couple level of the framework. And um, we found that you know, women really struggled to communicate with their partners and they were often ineffective in getting their partners to reduce. At the social and uh, community level, um, men talked about how male peer pressure, desires for friendship, and really to cope with the stress of poverty were barriers to reducing. 
And then at the structural and economic level, um, women didn't want their partners to drink, but really they were concerned about how the drinking was diverting precious resources away from the family. And so all of this kind of this mixed methods data culminated in a multi-level approach to reducing alcohol use, which is the pilot study. And so we decided to focus on the economic level and the relationship or dyadic level. And we started perusing the literature to see what had been done in these separate domains in ways that we might think about combining them. So economic strengthening interventions take a variety of different approaches, ranging from cash transfers to microfinance to savings-based approaches. We settled on a savings-based approach that was done in Uganda by uh, Fred Samawala with adolescent girls at risk for HIV. For our relationship strengthening component, there's been a few studies in Sub-Saharan Africa. We ended up settling on the Utandu Luwetu study, which uh, Mallory has been involved with, that was efficacious at improving couple communication skills as a pathway to increasing couples testing and counseling. So the overall objective of our pilot is to develop and pilot test a combined economic and relationship strengthening intervention. The premise is that we hope to redirect funds spent on alcohol use into more productive uses for the households. And we propose to do this by engaging couples together on alcohol use and working together on savings, equipped with communication and financial skills to do this in order to reduce their alcohol use, improve their relationships, and um, improve adherence. So the economic strengthening uh, activities consist of a couple-based uh, savings account at a national bank. They will save their money every month for 10 months, and they'll, get, they'll be eligible for a one-to-one -one match. Um, and then at these monthly group sessions, they will get financial literacy education as a couple. And at the end of the 10 months, the goal is that they take what they've saved and invest it in some sort of income-generating activity for their family. That's going to break the cycle of poverty. And at the, because this is a group-based model, they'll also get savings and alcohol peer support. For relationship strength and activities, we're um, going to be doing some group-based sessions on general relationship dynamics and communication. Believe it or not, you can teach people how to communicate constructively with each other. <laughs> and then they'll receive one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions to help them work towards their goal of choice, whether it's around alcohol or savings. This is a, a summary of our phases. We're currently in the first phase where we're taking the two manuals from these different interventions, synthesizing them in a meaningful way, and doing some focus group discussions to get feedback. Then we're developing our procedures, manuals, and instruments for the pilot and doing a pilot RCT with 80 couples. So this is our pilot study design. We're uh, recruiting drinkers. Most of them will be male um, who are on ART from several HIV clinics. We'll enroll their partner. We'll randomize them to either the treatment arm, which is the combined intervention, or an enhanced standard of care. They'll participate for around 10 months in the intervention, and then we'll assess them after they've taken their savings, hopefully started their business, and we'll follow up with them at 10 and 15 months. So the pilot's really focused on feasibility and acceptability. We're, we're not going to look at preliminary efficacy um, in the pilot, but we will in the future R01, hopefully to follow. And we'll be looking at number of drinking days confirmed with a PATH biomarker, as well as self-reported adherence in viral suppression. Um, our secondary outcomes, we're, we're very interested in mental health and, and food insecurity as well. So I hope I've uh, communicated to you in, in the very short period of time really the need for these multi-level approaches to addressing complicated issues around alcohol use in sub-Saharan Africa. I don't think it's enough just to empower people economically if they don't have the skills to work together as a couple around these issues. Approaches that address endemics or co-occurring conditions that interject interact synergistically is really important, and this study is essentially addressing the syndemic of violence, substance use, and HIV. And then finally, I really think in this particular context, it's critical to involve partners, but also family members and friends and others who offer support, um, which I think is going to be key to reducing alcohol use. And this, we're proposing just one model of one way of doing this with couples, but certainly this is an area of future research. So just want to acknowledge the co-investigators on my KO1, Drs. Han, Neelands, Darvis, Samawala, and Makandawiri, my KO1 mentors, two of whom are sitting in the room, Drs. Johnson and Gandhi, our funders, the CIFAR, and our staff and research participants. Thank you. So thank you, Amy. It's great to hear about projects just when they're getting up and going, because often we don't hear about it until years later. And so it's great to hear uh, just at the early stages. We have time for a question or two. And Monica, true to form, has her hand up first. So Monica. <laughs> I was just wondering if you, when you're doing the couples, do you 
quantify alcohol use um, by self-report and then also by the couple um, and compare those two measures, metrics? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, actually, it, um, we are using self-reports, um, and we, we do ask the partners um, using, we created a partner version of the Audit C, and the partners actually, it is hi highly correlated with the drinkers report as well. That hasn't, other studies that just came out have not found that correlation, but in our sample we have. So they're married couples, they've been together a long time, and I think they really know each other well. Quick question. This is beautiful. Um, how are you assessing and managing intimate partner violence? So you pull uh, alcohol use out of the couple. Do you make women more at risk? Or is this something that's not an issue? Or how are you monitoring that? Um, yeah, I mean, we have established procedures for making sure that the women are not at risk um, when they enroll in the study as well. Um, and we, we will be monitoring IPV throughout the study, but really our, 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 you know, certainly IPV can happen, right? But we really think it's going to actually reduce the, the risk of violence. So that's our hypothesis, and I feel very strongly that once we can get the alcohol down, um, the violence will follow from that. So, but a close thing to monitor. Uh, maybe just one more question. Oh, yeah, whoever. Um, I'm just wondering, is there sort of an expressed desire on behalf of um, the men in the study or like the couple for either increased adherence uh, to um, antiretrovirals or like a decrease in alcohol consumption? Is that part of the um, like enrollment, I guess? Um, you know, we're, we're going to pitch the study to them and, you know, explain what's involved and um, uh, surprisingly, a lot of the men are interested in reducing their alcohol use. So, you know, contrary to what we would think, they do want to change, they just don't know how and they need support to do that. So, um, yeah, we'll find out once we start enrollment. And I think that's what uh, one of the benefits of acceptability and feasibility are part of, are key outcomes for the study. So that'll be, I'm sure, one of the things you're watching for. So I want to, we've done an amazing job. I want to thank our speakers and the audience for keeping us on schedule for this very ambitious thing. Um, so thank you, Steve Shoptoff, for coming all the way from LA and being here earlier than any of us were here this morning, amazingly. Um, and I, um, I invite everyone to follow up with him if you can't find his contact information. I'll dig up his home address and send you that. No. Um, and Amy is here as well. She's at UCSF and very responsive. And I know she's probably eager to uh, field any more questions or future collaborations with you. So thank you all. And please keep coming back. to uh, Next month we have, oh gosh, uh, Bob Siciliano. What's he going to be talking about? So um, Monica, I'm looking at you. What's, what's our next? So he's coming on February 12th. It's Dr. Robert Silicano yep. um, from Hopkins. And again, we'll have another ESI lunch and some good opportunity Yes, and the whole and the right. So that's the pairing there, and so we've got all the others on the uh, website, and we've got a very uh, full and uh, impressive uh, calendar this year. So thank you all, and happy 2020. Thank you.